Welcome, Laura. How are you? Hi, Josh. Uh, very well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm not too bad at all, thank you. Um, it's just been a really great day so far. I think at the moment, at last count, let's see where we are with the donations. Um, so I think it's over £5,000 now. Um, so you That's know, fantastic. The target. And um, yeah, we're not even halfway through day one yet. So it really does... I've yeah, caught a little bit of a day. It is, um, I've caught a few snippets as and when I can. It is absolutely fantastic. You've had loads of comments. It sounds like there's been some really useful information and um, really well done to you and to Alice for, uh, for putting this all together. It looks like it's just a fantastic event. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, so what we'll do is, we'll, have you got some slides together? I do, yes. I'm going to try and share screen. I've only done it once before, so hopefully it will work. Um, <laughs> Shall I, shall I kick off? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, share your screen. Let's just test that's working. Fingers yeah. crossed. Okay. Yep. So I can see that. Um, let's see if that goes over to Facebook and YouTube. Yeah, that looks to be all good. Um, so what we'll do is, if you're happy just to, for people who don't know who you are, um, introduce yourself, kick things off. I'll mute my mic and turn my video off just so we get the best possible connection. Um, yeah. And then we'll take it from there. Perfect, thank you very much. Perfect, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Laura Chip. For those, who don't, for those of you who don't know me, um, I um, run a company called VATNAV. We specialise in VAT in particular for the travel events and hospitality sector. Um, we're doing quite a lot of work with service departments at the moment for reasons that will become clear, hopefully, um, in, in the next half an hour to 45 minutes. Um, what I want to talk about today is it's very much aimed at the service department sector. Um, and we're looking at a scheme called the TOM scheme, which some of you may have heard of, um, others may have no clue what that is and what it actually means. Um, you may feel even less um, inclined to think, how is this um, affecting us? So um, TOMS itself stands for the, uh, the Tour Operators Margin Scheme. So it, I think many service department operators may have seen that and thought, it doesn't apply to me, that sounds completely out of my uh, remit. But, um, but if hopefully it will become clear that actually it will apply to many of you and it can give some really good benefits for that, both going forward and also for your past position. So today I want to cover, first of all, the, the VAT treatment for service departments using the normal VAT rules. This is where you're just accounting for VAT, um, not within TOMS, um, on a normal basis under those normal VAT rules. Then I'm going to look at how this, um, this is different under TOMS, how this can really benefit you if your services do qualify under the TOMS rules. Then I'm going to look at obviously the uh, most important bit is how you do qualify for, for TOMS VAT and um, there's various options for the use of the scheme and we want to make sure that um, as much as possible any business who's using those TOMS rules falls really neatly within those criteria because um, otherwise obviously HMRC could be uh, knocking on your door and we do not want that. Um, we want to make sure that you use TOMS optimally, so where it doesn't apply or it doesn't work out best, you avoid it. And I'm also going to touch at the end for other VAT and cash flow opportunities um, for the sector, especially in light of obviously cash flow over the coronavirus uh, period. So to start off with, what is the normal VAT treatment of serviced accommodation? So we start off from a point with VAT. Now, with property and VAT, the rules can be slightly complex. I'm hopefully going to make it as simple as possible um, today for the sector that we're concerned with. So we start off um, for residential property, which is what we're looking at. Um, commercial property has very different VAT structure, um, a lot more different um, liabilities. For residential properties, the default VAT position is that it's exempt from VAT. So where you have your, um, your contracts that you may have with landlords for these long residential lets of service departments, you'll often see that they don't include VAT. It's exempt um, as a service. 
um, in general for VAT. However, there's, a, there's an exception for VAT, and if anyone has um, ever been bored at night and read the VAT legislation, you'll see there's a lot of exceptions to different rules um, with VAT. One exception to this exemption is where you've got um, accommodation which is held out for visitors or tourists or travellers. So here we're normally talking about hotel rooms. So this exception to this VAT exemption means that under normal circumstances, those that accommodation that is um, primarily for use with, for travellers is subject to VAT at 20%. So in many cases, because service departments are very similar in nature to hotels, inns, boarding houses, um, as we refer to them in VAT law, it means that um, service departments under normal VAT rules, you'll be charging 20% on the selling price of your services. As this is often quite a big cost um, to service departments where you're selling to individuals who can't themselves recover that. It means that if you sell an apartment for 120 pounds per night, it means that 20 pounds, um, which is included in that rate, you have to pay over to it. It comes obviously directly off your, um, your profit margin. Now there is also, I think what many call the 4% uh, the rule for long stays, um, there is a reduced VAT rate um, for short term sort of tourist accommodation where the person stays longer than 28 days. This is under the normal VAT rules, we're not talking about TOMS now. After 28 days, those first 28 days, you must charge 20% VAT on the full value of accommodation. However, from the 29th day onwards, VAT is only charged on what we call the non-accommodation aspect, um, up to a, a sort of minimum of 20% of the value. So normally, for most people, accommodation is, is definitely more than 80% of the value. So we just say we only charge VAT on 20% of the value, hence the sort of 4% rule, because um, 20% of, of 20. Um, so this means that if, if those of you, I think this is a good point for those of you who can't use TOMS or who, who don't want to use TOMS, um, if you are selling services where the person's staying longer than 28 days, do consider that actually only 4% of that um, essentially is charged after that, after that first 28 days. So if anyone hasn't been doing that to date, do have a look at um, your services. There's uh, with that a possibility to reclaim any VAT overpaid in the past if you haven't been doing that. And that's just under the normal VAT rules. Now as I mentioned um, a couple of minutes ago, where your direct costs of your services, um, the key cost will be the rent and as this is normally exempt because your landlord themselves aren't selling holiday accommodation, they're selling you a sort of 12-month residential lease, um, that cost is exempt. So you often have no VAT to recover on purchases, but quite a massive amount of VAT to pay on your selling price. So VAT 20% on your selling price, but no VAT to recover on purchases. This is quite a heavy chunk of your margin um, overall, and it means that service department operators often face quite large VAT bills overall. So what can we do to, uh, to alleviate this? So we consider the TOMS rules. So as I said, TOMS stands for Tour Operators Margin Scheme. Now, as I said, it sounds like a bit of a strange one for people in the property sector to consider themselves as tour operators. Um, the rules apply a lot more widely than um, they, they sort of, well, than, than it, the name suggests, I guess. Um, you, um, you fall into the Tour Operators Margin Scheme under certain conditions and certain rules. Um, and one of those is um, the um, when you're providing tourist accommodation. Um, we'll go into the conditions in a bit more detail um, over the course of the next half an hour or so. Um, but the key point there is that if you're a service department operator, you may very well be doing a sort of job similar in nature to a tour operator because you are selling tourist accommodation. Now, the, the, the first thing I want to sort of talk about with this is that TOMS applies um, per supply rather than a business. So you may, for example, if you've got a pro property portfolio of, you know, 10, 100 properties or whatever, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to apply TOMS for every single property. But um, as we'll see from looking at the conditions, once the conditions apply to a certain supply, you can't just pick and choose. 
Um, so we'll go through a bit in a bit um, where TOMS may not be the best solution. Um, but where you have one particular property, you can't just say, right, I'm going to make one of these sales um, a TOMS sale and another not. It's per property because it is the property will meet the conditions or not meet the conditions. So the effect of TOMS is that standard rated VAT is still due, but instead of being paid on the full selling price of the service, it's paid only on the direct gross margin made. So that's quite a significant difference actually, because instead of paying that 20% of that on the full selling price, you're now only applying it to the margins, your profit margin on the accommodation. Now you can't recover any VAT on your direct costs, um, but normally the, the main direct cost and sometimes the only direct cost, um, which qualifies for TOMS, is the rent. And as we've already established, that is exempt from VAT in a lot of cases, in most cases that I've seen. So you're actually not losing anything by this block on input VAT recovery under TOMS, but you're gaining a massive amount by not having to pay VAT on the full selling price. You're only paying for it, paying it on the margin that you make. Now VAT can still be recovered on overheads. So again, you're not missing out um, on anything there. You can still recover the VAT on all your purchases made other than the direct cost of the um, service department themselves. A um, couple of, I suppose, disadvantages is that you can't issue a VAT invoice to the customer for your services. So if, they, if your customers are corporates, they can't recover um, any VAT you charge them. Um, so again, that's a, that's a point to consider when you're looking at you know, um, whether TOMS is right for you. Um, but there's also no reduction in the VAT rate for long stay accommodation. So that 4% rule I mentioned um, a few minutes ago, you don't get that under TOMS. Um, but normally I think for those, um, most service department operators I've um, been chatting to recently, they do have a few long stays, but their business mainly consists of, sort of short um, per night stays or per week stays. Um, in which case, yes, you may have a little bit of a disadvantage um, from having to pay 20% on the margin for those particular services, but the benefit of using TOMS very much outweighs those few cases. Not always, so of course, it's, it's absolutely the right thing to do to, to make sure you review all your services um, and, and make sure that if, if TOMS does benefit you, you use it. If it doesn't benefit you, you do everything you can to stay out of the rules. So, a very quick comparison, this is uh, obviously very basic um, when we do calculations uh, a little bit more in depth um, than this, but this is really just to demonstrate what we're talking about in terms of that difference in VAT payable. So let's take a scenario where we've got um, annual turnover, we'll come onto this in a bit, but with TOMS we look at all of the services over across the financial year. So for the purpose of this we'll take annual turnover, so that's based on check-ins within the year. So let's say that VAT inclusive, everything all together, you've made £120,000 worth of income from your service apartments under TOMS in the year. Um, and your cost of your rents, um, again, that has been invoiced um, based on the time within that year, um, is 78000 Now, under the normal VAT rules, we are saying that our annual turnover is 120000 Out of that, 20000 is the VAT. That's the VAT payable on the full selling price um, of the service, 100,000 plus 20,000 VAT. Um, so that's what you're paying under the normal VAT rules. You've got no input VAT to recover on direct costs because your direct cost is just your rent here. So there's nothing, nothing there, it's VAT exempt. So your net amount payable to HMRC is 20,000. Now under TOMS, our output VAT paid is 7,000. Reason being that we've got annual turnover of 120. Um, our cost is 78, so our margin is 42. So all we do is we carve the VAT out of that 42, and we say that the VAT's payable is 7,000. So as you can see, between the two different methods, in this particular case, there's a difference of 13,000, so a 65% reduction in VAT payable um, O to HMRC. Now obviously this is an illustration only, but actually the figures have been kind of plucked out of some real life examples in terms of the saving that we've made. In many cases, we, we see a sort of 50 to 70% um, saving in VAT just based on, um, on this particular method of calculating. So as I hope you can see, where TOMS does apply, it's a really good alternative position to the normal VAT rules. 
Now with TOMS, um, I should mention that where you fall into the criteria, TOMS has to be used. If you don't fall within the criteria, TOMS can't be used. So I'm just gonna go through the conditions, so those criteria that need to be in place in order for TOMS to apply to your business or those service departments that you operate. Now, um, some of these are gonna be quite obvious. Others are, let's say, are gray areas um, for VAT. In, I, I talk, um, I, I obviously do VAT all day long and I spend most of my time talking about the gray areas. So um, yes, there's quite a few of those um, in here in these conditions. So tour operators margin scheme, when does it apply? So in order to make sure that you fall within TOMS, you must satisfy these four conditions. So the first one is that there must be a supply of travel services. The second one is that you, the supplier, must be acting in your own name. The third is that the services must be acquired from a third party and are supplied without material alteration or further processing. And the services must be provided for the benefit of a traveller. So I'm going to look at those conditions um, in detail. It's really important that for those of you who um, want to use TOMS and that TOMS is beneficial, you have to satisfy um, these four conditions. So it's really important. I think we see quite a few people who say, yeah, we're just going to use TOMS. It seems that loads of other users are, loads of other operators are using it. So we're just going to do it. That's great, but you must fall within these conditions. So I really want to stress the importance of these to make sure that your business has no risks um, from using TOMS. So Tom, what are travel services? So talked earlier about tourist accommodation being a travel service. So it must um, be held out for use by tourists, travelers or visitors. So this would normally be where you're sort of in direct competition with hotels. So you're advertising on booking.com, you're on Airbnb, um, or wherever you're holding yourselves out as um, an alternative to hotel accommodation. The service provided is very similar. So you obviously don't charge anyone for local sort of council tax rates. You don't, um, you have a sort of, um, you know, um, you provide the furniture, of course, you provide the linen, um, et cetera. It's things that hotels would normally do. You don't necessarily have to provide add-ons like breakfast or other sort of facilities, but in terms of the bare natures of what a hotel does and is, it provides sleeping accommodation, as we say in that law, sleeping accommodation, um, and it must be an establishment similar to a hotel in boarding house, etc. So again, it's a slightly grey area, but normally I think most service department operators that I've reviewed fall quite neatly within this bracket. The only thing I would sort of um, have a little bit of a sort of issue with is if um, the majority of the services are, for example, putting people up for a year in the accommodation. Now that I think, is that person really a visitor there for a year? Most likely not. Most likely that's going to be a residential um, accommodation. I, um, I had this issue with student accommodation a while back and people were saying, well, is it, is, are these students residential in this place or are they not so you look at things like is that person paying council tax are you providing the tv license or are they things like this so it can be quite a gray area but normally where you're um you're doing these services on a per night or a per week basis you will satisfy the definition of tourist accommodation for for tom's purposes um, the next point is that you must be acting in your own name. Now, this is normally um, absolutely fine for most service accommodation providers. It's not normally an issue here. What we mean here is that you have a contract for the purchase of the accommodation from your landlord. So you'd normally have um, like a 12 month lease agreement. Um, occasionally, I see people um, buying an accommodation on a per night, per week basis, but that's not the norm. We normally see um, year long rent contracts, seasonal, um, whatever that might be. But you're buying in in your own name from the landlord. Um, a couple of, uh, sort of small diagrams to sort of just demonstrate this point. Um, in this case, you've got a landlord providing um, a sort of sale of an apartment or um, a rental contract to a service department operator, and they are selling on in their own name to the individual. Now, this is in contrast to this type of arrangement where 
you may be sort of um, receiving payment from the customer and giving payment on to the landlord, but actually you're acting as an agent and instead the landlord themselves has a direct contract with the end customer. So if you're acting in this situation that we've got on screen now as an agent, TOMS doesn't apply. Your only service in this particular diagram is the intermediary services you're providing to the landlord, you're acting as an agent there. So normally this is where you've got a management fee rather than you actually acting in your own name. But most service department operators operate like this. You have a proper long lease in from your landlord and then you're selling on again in your own name to end users. So that's normally a condition that we're quite comfortable with um, and is, is sort of ascertained quite easily just by looking at the names um, and conditions on the contracts. Third condition, again, um, a very, very easy one to, to go through in that in the UK, TOMS only applies compulsorily if you are providing the services to the person who is using them. So whether that is a, um, a customer or a business, whoever it is, your, your customer, the person who you are selling to, is themselves using it, they're not selling on to anyone else. So your supplies are retail rather than wholesale. Again, I don't think I've seen that many cases, if at all, um, where anyone is selling wholesale supplies. It can happen if, for example, you're supplying a company um, with a let and they might be recharging it out to different departments. Um, but even in that case, you can still apply TOMS at the moment on, a, on an optional basis. So this is, again, not normally any particular um, issue um, for most contracts I've looked at. The key, um, the key point for service department operators is the fourth condition, and this is one of material alteration. So the um, best way to explain this, I guess, is if... For Tom's, what we're talking about, and I guess for the classic tour operator, if you think about it, they buy in um, sort of like bulk amount of hotel rooms and sell on to individuals. They don't themselves go to the hotel. They never touch the hotel. They're not doing anything to that hotel. They're not altering it in any way. It's literally a case of almost online buying in, selling on. There's no physical presence or sort of interference in, in, in a sort of legal term with, um, with those uh, apartments or hotel rooms or whatever it might be. Now if we contrast this um, with someone who may buy in a blank apartment with no furniture in it at all and then add in furniture, add in interior design, add in their own branding, their own sort of tech technology and stuff um, and then sell in, sell on even, um, what we've got, what the, the sort of bare bones of what we've brought, bought in is very, very different to what we've sold on. So in that case, um, the services are said to have been materially altered by that operator because what you've bought in, bought it, bought in, um, is the blank apartment and what you're selling on is something completely different. It's a holiday let. So really the question to ask ourselves is, when you buy the service in from the landlord, could you, in that state, sell it on as holiday accommodation? Now, you may add um, different things to the apartment. Um, so a lot of people might add um, like kettles or TVs or you know, replace cushions and things as they, as they get worn and older and stuff. You may put in a little bit of furniture um, yourself, but the bare bones of the whatever you're advertising to your customers must already be there to start off with. So you're advertising sleeping accommodation. So you really need that there, there to be already beds in there for however many rooms, um, your sofas, your classic accommodation. You may add um, pictures and cushions or whatever. That's fine. That's not material. Um, but if you have to add the bed, um, then you can't say you've bought in sleeping accommodation. Um, I also had a case a few months ago where they had they bought in all the furniture um, as sorry, a furnished a holiday let, but they'd advertised the apartment as state of the art technology kind of focus, all these media and entertainment systems, and they were providing those themselves. So in that situation, I sort of thought, well, it's okay, but. The fact that they've advertised it as state of the art and when they're buying in, you've only got the bare bones. You've really added something to, to sort of um, make that, to sort of fulfill your advertisement. So really consider what your, um, 
what you're adding in and whether you yourself have materially altered the service. So there's not really that much, there's not, again, I said this is a grey area, um, it's common with that. There's not really a definition of material alteration. Um, there are various sort of guidance notes from HMRC, including this one at the moment that isn't published that I have seen. Um, but I think in, in general, there is, there's not that much we can say to confirm, but my, um, my own opinion is that the following help to um, confirm that there's been um, no material alteration. So the apartment's furnished by the landlord. So you, the operator, add very little to the apartment. So again, you may add your cushions or your kettle or whatever, but you're not adding the key components. Um, so again, yes, the th third one, so the operator does not itself add or do anything which is key to the apartment. So for example, if you provided a catering service yourself, you're doing something that is very key to, um, to a, a serviced um, service apartment if you're advertising it as um, a catered service apartment. Um, your contract with your landlord, um, really important um, to make sure that it's defined as um, it allows you to sublet, um, reason being that if it doesn't, um, then for that we look a lot at contracts and HMRC look at a lot, a lot at con contracts. Um, and if it doesn't allow for subletting, then the question is asked, well, what are you actually doing then? How are you buying a service if you're not legally permitted to? Um, and there's no, um, there's not um, a, a great deal of contact between your own staff and travellers. So your own staff may be there to meet and greet, um, to hand over keys, um, but you're not sort of providing a sort of in-house service. You're not providing room service yourselves. Um, you're not sort of um, on site all the time, that type of thing. Um, but again, it's a grey area. A lot of these, it's, it's about looking on balance. So if you do one of these things, it doesn't mean that you won't fall within tongs, but it means that obviously you need to look at the balance quite carefully. Um, okay, so really just a very sort of uh, short run through of the tongs calculation. Um, really just to say that again, as I said earlier, is done on an annual basis, um, looking at check-ins within the year and costs within the year. Um, so we sort of true it up at year end. Throughout the year, we pay that on a sort of provisional or estimated basis. Um, reasons being that in classic tour operator setups, there's often rebates and forex issues only known at year end, but this just means that that's the way to do it for TOMS. Um, so I guess, in terms of uh, sales and costs, this is what we'd normally be typically looking at for an annual adjustment calculation. Um, we would look at um, turnover based on check-ins, and then we'd look at what costs qualify um, under TOMS. Um, I've said that rent obviously does qualify. We're looking at direct costs. Things like utilities and cleaning often don't qualify. It really depends on the circumstances but other costs such as salaries, maintenance, capex, um, et cetera, is not a direct cost for TOMS because we'd really be looking at um, exactly what's going on for that particular accommodation where you've got capital expenditure, it's not a sort of per night cost. So then we would look at our TOMS margin is our turnover minus our gross direct costs. And then we take that as um, one sixth. Now, in our annual adjustment, we'll normally have paid an amount of that over in the year under this provisional basis. So let's say we've paid 81,000 over. So our annual adjustment is the amount then that comes back um, to you um, at the end of the year from HMRC if you've overpaid. Now this can be either way, this is a very, very quick run through because um, I know we're sort of getting to the end of the, uh, the session. Um, but this is just to show you really that this is how we um, account for TOMS and it is a calculation. It's not just a case of you looking at um, your rent for this month and your turnover that month, take away one for the other. It is a fairly involved calculation, so definitely get that set up correctly. So what do you do if you think you may be within TOMS? So first of all, if you think there's a possibility that this may apply to you, absolutely review your services and your contracts and really have a look at whether that um, applies. I've seen so many service apartment operators who have only just realised um, these TOMS rules exist. Um, and when we've looked at their contracts and their sort of practical factors, found that actually, yeah, they really should have been using these rules and saving themselves a lot of money. So if your services do fall within TOMS, 
obviously change your VAT treatment from today. Um, and also then really consider the VAT data position. Um, you can, where you have overpaid VAT in the past, you can go back for four years um, and correct that. So quite a lot of service department operators have had backdated VAT refunds on this basis. And the other thing to say that if you have reviewed um, your services and you think, well, I'm not really sure they do qualify for TOMS, then really the question to ask is, are there any tweaks you can make so that they do? Um, I've just put a couple of um, short examples here and where we have seen um, that some, where some people's services haven't fall, fell within TOMS, um, but we've changed that um, very, very slightly so that actually they then do qualify. So for example, if your accommodation is bought in unfurnished, um, could you buy furniture in the landlord's name? So you may buy the furniture um, and you may say to the landlord, I'm going to buy this on your behalf. Can you contractually sell me the apartment plus furniture? I've bought the furniture for you, but I get exclusive use of that furniture. Um, now again, that's a contracts thing. You'd need to make sure the contracts were amended to, to take care of that. But absolutely is a possibility. Um, if your staff form a key part of the service, already could you do some of this automated so for example you take away check-in staff make it automatic um, you take away the need for your own staff to be um, providing catering by having a sort of automatic delivery service etc um, i've seen some apartments advertise themselves um, or operators advertising and saying we put in state-of-the-art interior design etc and I've said, well, if you are designing the properties for the landlord, it's, it's possibly there, you're materially altering it. So again, that, that disqualifies you from Tom's. But actually, when I talk to them, they say, well, we don't really do that much. We just want to advertise it as um, you know, that we're putting state of the art things in as a sort of boost to our services. So I think it's with that, is there a way you can advertise it slightly differently? So your, your service itself is still sold fully, but that you're not... Um, damaging your VAT position. Um, the other thing is if you own the properties, um, is there a way you could structure yourself so you have another company to buy and sell um, the properties from you? So for it, I mean, I, I don't like tax planning this for this particular reason um, because in a lot of cases, um, it doesn't quite work out an HMRC see through it. But if you've got one company that is definitely a property company, its main purpose is to, to own buildings and uh, manage them, furnish, furnish them. It's very reasonable to see that you could have a separate company to, um, to obviously handle the marketing, the sales, etc. And if one sells to the other and it's a sort of legitimate um, reason, then Tom's could apply that. I would absolutely stress though that you would really need to look into that carefully to do it to make sure that um, there's no anti avoidance rules that apply there. But I think the point is it can be done. Um, so very, very quickly now, um, when may TOMS not be op optimal? If you're only doing corporate let, as I mentioned earlier, you may not be able to um, recover, um, well, they, not, they won't be able to recover the VAT, so you might not be um, actually getting gaining that much from it. Same for where you do a large amount of long lets, so long stays under the 4% rule. And uh, finally, if you are charged VAT on your accommodation purchases, um, so so I think some people that don't have exempt rental contracts with the landlords, um, but instead they buy accommodation on a short term basis and they're charged that. And in that case, you're not really gaining anything from Tom, so it's better to sort of stay out. Um, very finally, um, just a couple of reminders um, for everyone this is um, that obviously over the coronavirus period, um, you want to make sure your cash flow um, is. Um, as optimal as possible. Do remember that HMRC have the deferral scheme set up for VAT returns for February, March and April. Um, don't pay over any VAT um, unless you want to. Make sure your HMRC direct debits are stopped so that you don't pay any VAT for your February, March or April return until uh, 31st of March 2021. Um, flat rate scheme, had a couple of questions about this, um, actually Josh brought up recently. Um, Flat rate scheme can be used for service department lets, um, but it is not as good as TOMS for what it does. And corporate structures I just mentioned um, as part of the slide before. Um, absolutely do have a look at this for VAT planning. Um, if uh, it, can, it can be useful to sort of uh, make, make a sort of service fall within TOMS, but again, really do make sure that this is um, looked at carefully. Um, so that's all I really wanted to say today. Um, 
on Tom's and that. Um, I hope it's been useful. And um, I'll ask Josh, uh, do you have any questions? <laughs> yeah, perfect. So we've got a couple of questions free. Let's have a look. Uh, um, uh, so we've got to say, if you personally own furnished property and own a service accommodation company also, the company contracts you to provide accommodation, can the company qualify for Tom's? I suppose that's quite similar to one of the points you mentioned where you basically got a separate company that very much does own property. It's perhaps got other properties that it lets out on a AST or a kind of longer term leasehold. And you've also got a separate company which does provide the property on a nightly rate. Would that look to apply? Yeah, so again, as I said, with, with corporate structures, I think like that, um, they can be used, but they, they absolutely need to have legitimate functions. Um, so if you have one business that is just um, decided, right, now I'm just going to set up a company who's not actually going to, you know, for the sole purpose of, of Tom's, um, in my opinion, that doesn't work. And HMRC would see through that quite quickly and most likely treat them as one um, for that purpose. But I have seen companies where we do have um, one, basically the function of each company is very set, it's very specialist in obviously the buying of property and maintaining the property. The second, its main function is the sort of sales and marketing um, of the property. So we've got there a really legitimate split in resources. If one is focused only on the property management itself, the other is very much about the sort of day-to-day -day dealing with the customers, etc. Then you can say, well, actually, both companies, it, it makes sense to actually split them into two companies. Um, you can absolutely see the um, justification in that. So, so it, it can work, but it is just, I'd say, look at it carefully, carefully if, um, if you're planning to do that. Yeah, so it's basically, you can't really do it just for VAT purposes. You have to have a commercial reason for this, uh, and then indeed... The actual facts have to follow how, how you're interpreting it you know they need to be separate companies and there needs to be a good commercial reason for it um yeah and as always you need to get professional advice when it gets complicated like this you can't really watch a webinar as great value as this is don't just apply this and then, okay yeah it's great separate two companies speak to a professional because there's so many things that we can't possibly cover because you would need it take years really to go through it all um and get that set up yeah, I think with um, with that, and this is um, not at all aimed at um, the property sector at all, this is just a general point. I think a lot of people think VAT is one of those things that is on the sidelines. So people think, oh, we'll sort of just do this for VAT. Um, whereas actually it is still, um, it, it's obviously it's, it's quite a big value in, in a lot of cases. Um, and HMRC do look at it carefully. Um, and for those of you who've never had a VAT inspection, um, lucky you, um, but um, when, when they do come round and, and visit or inspect, um, I have, I guess I've been on the other end of that and seen it where things do go wrong and, and people have sort of decided, yeah, we're just going to sort of take, take a casual approach and say this sort of works, let's, let's do this great VAT treatment. But if you haven't looked into it fully, um, HMRC could very easily pick it apart and this then you know, ends up in, in possible assessments uh, for that data. So I think what I'm trying to say with all of this is it is a great um, use of, of um, well, a, a, a VAT treatment. Um, using TOMS in this sense really, really helps a lot of people out. But I would always stress just make sure that you don't take the risk um, and don't do it without proper, um, a proper review of, um, of your services and how it works. So I don't want to see anyone um, caught out and, and sort of have to look back four years and pay back a load of that that they weren't expecting. So just, just make sure that you do it properly. Um, and in this case with any sort of VAT um, issue, to be honest, not just Tom's, but obviously Tom's itself is quite uh, complex and, uh, and does need a bit of care. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly agree with that. Um, so one thing, I know you mentioned that when you're kind of with the whole material change side of things, um, the key part is really that you could almost, when you get the pr uh, property in from the landlord, it's at a point at which you could effectively effectively sublet it on, stick it on Airbnb. It might not be the best service accommodation, but it is one nonetheless in terms that there are beds, um, sofas and that kind of stuff in there. So for people that have already kind of missed the boat in that they've already got these on just unfurnished basis, they're furnished them themselves what can they almost do? Is it kind of possible to go back to their landlord, renegotiate 
um, to make the contracts fall within Tom's and basically kind of look to give them some furniture as a gifted deposit or whatever it may be. Is there that yeah. kind of flexibility here? So I think you could, I think you could only do that going forward. So you wouldn't be able to look back if that was the case, but yes, absolutely. So I think with, with that, you could, um, yeah, exactly. You could um, assign the, the sort of value of the services to your landlord um, in some way. And, um, and then they give you exclusive use on sort of, you know, higher purchase or whatever of the, um, of the furniture and, and other related goods. Um, but yes, in that case, um, I would really want to see in your contracts that you have um, something about that. So it's clear that even though you may have the purchase receipts for the service for the furniture, um, you've you've done something to transfer ownership of those of those furniture services, sorry, furniture services, um, furniture items um, to the landlord, um, so that they actually own them when they're then selling on um, those those services within the property to you. I keep saying services, I mean furniture. Um, I don't know what's going on, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think we've got time for one more question. We're just about to squeeze that in. Um, can we own property to do it, SA, and the company set up and pay rent to personal account also use Tom's? Um, so I suppose, I mean, if they own the property personally um, and then do SA and the company set up and then get the rent personally, I suppose that, that's a similar structure to having a separate limited company. Um, so if you were to own them personally yeah. and then rent them on to a trading service accommodation company, um, would that be allowable? That's an interesting point, actually. Um, I think I probably, I mean, yes, I mean, obviously the contracts would need to um, to make that clear. But yeah, I mean, actually, that probably gives you a fairly good um, argument because your company is a separate person and presumably your company itself has the sort of sales and marketing um, functions that would be necessary in order to, um, you know, obviously deal with all the customers, etc. So actually you as a separate person, um, as an individual, um, actually you selling then on to the the company for almost resale yeah i mean i think that could work again you'd, you'd want to make sure um that it was contractually you know um like well uh, set up uh, properly but yeah there's no reason why that couldn't work um in theory definitely okay fantastic i'd just like to thank you uh, for taking the time out of your day to come on and contribute towards this um throughout the live we've had close to 300 people um so certainly people have enjoyed it taken a lot of value from this um i know i have as well um so really make sure everyone get your donations in um because no doubt from the basis of here you've saved a lot of vat or you will do now you know to get your um agreements with furniture in place um and, and it'll meet, meet all the boxes there so that's going to save you a lot of money give a little bit to a little bit of that to the nhs help those guys on the front line um and thank you very much laura pleasure thank you very much and yeah donate what you can and uh, enjoy the rest of the event thank you very much for having me perfect Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.